Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot to the National Library for inviting me to all this lecture. It was initially certainly planned in different circumstances, in a different situation. And I also initially gave a different title, a title that now seemed to me somewhat pretentious, at least my subtitle, Kafka for the 21st century. Well, we have experienced how quickly uh, things can change. So to talk about the century uh, probably doesn't make much sense. However, in changing my title to Kafka's Communities, I nevertheless want to situate my lecture in time and space and try to think about how thinking about Kafka's communities is relevant in time and space, both in a narrow and in a big way. The narrow way, what made me change the title, and I did this two days ago, when I was asked, should we keep the title, and I gave this alternative one, um, was a sense, um, probably semi-conscious of uh, lack and longing for the very word community uh, that many of us experience in situations of isolation in, uh, with this new household word self-isolation that um, is somewhat dubious. But also maybe the other side of this, the possibility of other forms of community, maybe even one of the kind we're experiencing right here and now. In a larger context, in terms of time, the question of communities and what Kafka as a key modernist has to say about this to us relates to a political situation where an increasing populism uh, has recreated the question of community in a new big political way. In a third, maybe even larger way, it is the question of communities in modernity in the sense of community in modernism, the early 20th century, of which Kafka is a key embodiment. It is indeed in Kafka's time that the question of community, such as in the work of Ferdinand Tönnies, the uh, tension between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, community and society, was widely discussed. And Kafka himself experienced this at many levels, just living in Prague and experiencing, on the one hand, rising nationalism, on the other, the closing of communities, and even what he experienced as being the community in which he lived, the Jewish German speaking community in Prague. So this is the larger, let's say, sociological context at a, a more intellectual and philosophical context. The question of uh, community in the early 20th century is related to um, the moment in which Kafka wrote and its questioning of the fundamental values of the Enlightenment that had developed into, uh, into the 19th century uh, modernity, the way Kafka experienced it. Values of the Enlightenment such as progress, reason, and one of them, and the one that is most relevant in our context, the question of autonomy. So the autonomy of the subject as a value of the enlightenment that was felt by many as turning into what would then in the early 20th century be called the isolated modern man yeah, isolation that would um, go to, you know, to the extent of becoming a kind of um, 
solipsism of sensing that the world was only into uh, in one's own head. On the other hand, uh, uh, resistance against modernity that would express itself in uh, holding on to or finding new forms of community. Now, what is this distinction between community and, uh, and society? The distinction uh, between a grouping that is held together by um, bonds of ritual, of tradition, of very often uh, an idea of, you know, blood bonds, uh, family bonds, as opposed to a society that is bound by rules and regulations um, at least the society in modernity. So within this uh, question, one can situate Kafka's reflections on community in time. In terms of space, I want to embed this, first of all, in the very concrete context in which we are meeting here, uh, namely the National Library. And um, I guess that having lectures on Kafka certainly has something to do with the uh, broad nachlas, uh, the Kafka manuscripts that were there and the whole, that are there and the whole discussion uh, that went on before that. Within this discussion, many voices um, express their ideas about Kafka in the context of community. Does Kafka belong to the Jews, to the Israelis, to the Germans, uh, to the world. Um, within these discussions, and I'm just giving an example, there was a, a, uh, an intervention by an important American literary critic who said in a text called Who Owns Kafka? Uh, wanted to demonstrate that Kafka actually uh, was adamant to belong to any kind of grouping and certainly to a Jewish one and certainly to a Zionist one and that therefore uh, the place of these manuscripts uh, should not be in the National Library. Now, uh, so you see that the question of Kafka communities is related to the very place in the context of which we are speaking here. Um, in a larger sense, the question of the relevance of Kafka's communities in terms of space, and I would not go into that, but it is certainly uh, an issue right here where we are in Israel, in the Middle East, uh, where the tension between those who think in terms of society and those who think in terms of community is, uh, is a source of, uh, of conflict and contention, both within and with uh, the neighbors and with the world at large. Um, so having situated uh, the topic in this way, I want to uh, spell out the aims of what I want to do here. I uh, primarily want to point out the complexities of Kafka's approach to communities in terms of its uh, doubleness and the way Kafka uh, belies all those who say either that Kafka was a centrally, and this, these voices exist, a centrally Jewish communitarian writer, although the word Jew does not come up in his fictional writing uh, at all. But, uh, Kafka has been appropriated by many for, um, for the Jewish community, on the one hand. On the other hand, there are those who uh, heavily uh, protest against such a kind of appropriation and um, claim the contrary. The same goes for the way Kafka's approach to communities are conceived either seeing him as a radical universal as a radical universalist or seeing him as a kind of communitarian thinker so affirming communities what i want to show is the radical doubleness of it now this doesn't come as a surprise um, because not only 
uh, is literature as such uh, medium in which such one-sided ideologies are not voiced and articulated, but also it is specifically Kafka's kind of writing that does that, and this is what I want to show. My aim is thus, on the one hand, to uh, point out the, uh, the, the way in which Kafka shows the dynamics of how communities come uh, into being and how they perpetuate themselves. And on the other hand, and this is probably my underlying secret aim throughout, I want to show what literature can do um, that maybe other discourses can't. For that purpose, I have to and want to uh, read texts with you, little texts. And uh, I will put them on the screen and I would like to read them together with you. And what I want to uh, focus on in terms of the constitution of community as Kafka conveys it to us is the way in which there are these two dynamics that are present. The one, the German word for it is Gleichschaltung, homogenization. When you have a group and you make them equal and the not equal, equal probably has still the ring of justice, but how you want to make them the same. The other is the even more obvious one, it is the way you exclude the other. So I have dealt with this question at length in my book when Kafka says we, because the very word we already suggests the possibility of speaking with one voice, but homogenizing all those in the name of whom you speak. And at the same time, what is implied there is a they a they that is not part of the we. I will uh, talk about three little texts. They are, the first is three lines. And now, um, okay. You all see my screen? Show this if you do. Do you see the screen? Okay. It's from a diary entry and it's a very famous one. Um, Doron, can one see the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, now it's better. What do I have in common with Perfect. Jews? I have hardly anything in common with myself and should stand very quietly in a corner, content that I can breathe. Now, the beginning of this diary entry could not be more straightforward. What I have in common with is a question that can be regarded as the starting point of all queries about an individual's identity or belonging. Kafka's question suggests that he will go on to reveal his relationship with the Jewish community or what would today be viewed as his Jewish identity. However, by the end of this passage, it becomes clear that these expectations will not be met. While Kafka's question is simple, his response is not. And what might seem at first glance a reluctance, if not a refusal to be part of a community, turns out to be a symptom of a lack of inner wholeness and coherence associated with what is generally called the modern crisis of identity, or what in German is called das unrettbare Ich, 
I am barely anything, I'm barely a subject, and certainly not the whole and integrated one. Now, in what follows in this sentence, is it, it is clear that Kafka does not turn to one of two familiar positions with which the modern individual collect, uh, confronts collectivities. He's not interested in pitting individualism against the exigences of a community, nor does he look into the opposite direction, to the possibility that the self-alienated modern individual might find refuge in a community. But what does Kafka do? And should stand very quietly in a corner, content that I can breathe well? Instead of taking a position and giving us an answer to his question, he conjures up an all-encompassing estrangement and in, puzzle, in a puzzling image describes the conclusion he should draw from this condition. Now, the sentence ends up in a little scene, in a scene of standing in a corner, almost a childhood uh, memory that maybe suggests shame, but is it that he's ashamed of not being able to join the community? Uh, we cannot really know. What we can know, when he says content that I can breathe, is that there is a kind of, you, you know, as a survival of even in, in the face of this dilemma, and of this question, and standing quietly in the corner also suggests that he's maybe taking the furthest distance from the center, but he's nevertheless in the room. Now, Kafka has himself described his situation in terms of communities, in a diary entry in 1921, when he writes of this borderland between loneliness and community. He said, I live in the borderland between loneliness and community. And the suggestion is that there is a land where he situates himself, where on the two sides, on the two extremes, beyond these borders, you have on the one hand, the uh, homogeneous, radical mass considered as a community, and on the other hand, the radical singularity and loneliness of, of the individual. Now, what is this in between? It seems as if Kafka is riding within this, these two borders, just as when Kafka says that he's content that he can breathe in the corner, well, Maybe one can equate, in Kafka's case, breathing with writing, as Kafka says, that his own existence is nothing but literature. So it is literature that is being created from within that place. I want to read now uh, uh, two little passages before I go to... Uh, before I go to the main two texts that I want to read with you. Uh, a passage from the Great Wall of China, where we read the following. Every fellow countryman was a brother for whom they were building a protective wall and who was thankful all his life, thankful with everything that he had and was. Unity, unity, in German, Einheit, Einheit rest on rest, a round dance of the people. Blood no longer confined in the meager circulatory system of the body, but rolling on sweetly and re returning to its source through the infinity of China. You could not have a better picture of what is meant by a community, uh, as I suggested, that is even based on blood. Now, having this passage here in Kafka's writings, certainly means that he could, from within, experience and see what this sense of living a community is like. It is also that he can empathize sufficiently with a position 
that would um, that would make uh, us understand what is attractive in uh, in belonging to a community, in being part of a community. And then another passage from researchers of a dog, where we read the following. Why wouldn't I behave like the others, live in harmony with my kind, and turn forever towards that what binds us, towards what binds us happily together, and not toward what time and time again, irresistibly, of course, tears us out of the circle of our kind. So this is the counter movement, something that tears us out of the circle of our kind. Now, the real uh, purpose of my lecture for myself is that I want to share with you two of my very favorite texts. The text called, and I just closed this here. I'm sorry, somebody just walked in. Two texts, the one called Community and the other called A Community of Scoundrels. Eine Gemeinschaft, no, it's called Gemeinschaft und eine Gemeinschaft von Schurken. Now these titles were given by Max Brod, but I owe Max Brod the fact that these were just passages in his Octavo notebooks. And it is thanks to Brod having given these titles that I could bring them together and that I could see how together they enlighten us about the dynamics in which communities are constituted, both in terms of their dangers and of their attraction. The two texts are complementary in a fascinating way because with the one text, the first, community, we get an insight into what I would call the uh, politics of the, uh, the for, let's say the, the foreign office. It is the way the community relates to its outside. In the second, it is about how the community relates inside. In the first, it is about exclusion. And in the second, it is about homogenization. OK. Um, since I, we don't have enough time to first read through the whole thing, uh, I will read and stop and read and, and explain. But uh, what matters to me here, along with the illustration of the dynamics of communities, is the way in which literature can, in microscopic ways, reveal um, things of huge consequences. So, By the way, this text in, uh, in the English translation, the one I had, was, is called Fellowship. And it is a very misleading translation. And uh, you will see why. It is also because it, does, uh, it takes it out of this context of the discussion of communities at the time. So, Gemeinschaft. We are five friends. One day we came out of a house, one after the other. First one came and placed himself beside the gate. Then the second came or rather glided through the gate like a little ball of quicksilver and then placed himself near the first one. Then came a third, then a fourth, then a fifth. Finally, we all stood in a row. People began to notice us. They pointed at us and said, those five just came out of that house. Since then, we've been living together. It would be a peaceful life if it weren't for a sixth one continually trying to interfere. Let's go till here. We have a very everyday situation. Five friends who come out of a house. They stand in a row. 
and who is speaking to us and telling us this? Uh, we. It is a single speaker who talks about the way this group came about. Now, let's look at the first sentence. We are five friends. One day, we came out of a house, one after the other, first one, then second, then third, then fourth, then fifth. There's a problem in this sentence. A very simple grammatical problem. Because what should this really be? At some point, so we have the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. If a we is speaking at some point, he should have said, then I came. By the end of this first sentence of the text, Kafka shows that with the constitution of a community, the individual I disappears. He has made him disappear. Finally, we all stood in a row. People began to notice us. They pointed at us and said, now, they're walking out of a house. Maybe it was raining and they are standing in a row. Or maybe there was a bus stop. Or in any case, what we are being uh, shown here is, uh, is the founding myth of this community. Now, the founding myth starts with a house one day at, you know, any day, any house. It is contingent. What is required is that it is seen as a gestalt from the outside. They pointed at us. And now the, one of the crucial sentences in this text. Since then, we've been living together. Now, in my classes, I like to tell the students that I remember from my doctor father, who started his class saying that what he's interested in, and I think this is something that it is a precious legacy uh, and that I have adopted to show the connection between a comma and a worldview. Now, here we can go even further because it's not just a comma, but the absence of a comma. It would be a peaceful life if it weren't for a sixth one continually trying to interfere. There is not a moment of break between. So the story would be completely different if it would be, we've li we lived peacefully together. One day a six came and interfered and disturbed us. But that's not how it works here. It would be a peaceful life if it weren't for a sixth one, which suggests that the sixth is constitutive of the community that without this sixth one who is trying to interfere and whom they don't want the community does not exist even because there's no moment in which they actually just were together the rest of the text is a fantastic parody of a justification for a com community to close ranks and you will hear the pseudo logic. It is a fantastic little piece of literature because it takes, you know, it, if you don't listen carefully, it sounds logical. It's full of because and therefore and thus. And when you read it, well, listen, you will see where Kafka takes us. So. So there is the sixth trying to interfere. He doesn't do us any harm, but he annoys us. And that is harm enough. Now in German, it's even, und das ist genug getan. So he takes a passive form and then transforms it into, you know, this is, as if this were an action. Now, why does he intrude when he's not wanted? We don't know him and don't want him to join us. There was a time, of course, when the five of us did not know one another either, and it could be said that we still don't know one another. But what is possible and can be tolerated by the five of us is not possible and cannot be tolerated with the sixth one. In any case, we're five and no one will be six. So you see the tautological structures 
that are in the midst of this seeming rational construct uh, is, you know, emptying itself out in terms of the legitimation and then. And what would be the sense of this togetherness anyway? It is also senseless for the five of us, but now we are ready together and we remain together, but we don't want a new union because of, uh, of our now experiences. Okay, so they seem to be what one would call a Schicksalsgemeinschaft. But when we look at the text, you know, a community of having experienced certain things together. Now, in literature, we have to look at what we know of the experiences of these five. And all we know of them is that one day they walked out of the house and that they're excluding the sixth one. But one could, I must admit, read this differently. One could say that there is a, you know, a possibility of a justification of having lived certain things together. But then, but how should we explain this to the sixth? Long explanation would amount to accepting him in our circle, so we prefer not to explain and not to accept him. He can sulk as much as he wants. We prefer not to explain anything and push him away with our elbows, and then we got this ending. But however much we push him away, back he comes. Now, how do we read this ending? One could say that this is a warning to the community that they're not going to get rid of him ever. So a kind of almost revenge of this attempt to exclude him. But maybe we ought to also take the position of the sixth one for a moment and wonder, well, actually, why does he want to come back? Why does he want to enter? Now, when we look at this ending and ask ourselves, what does this issue of the explaining and not explaining mean? Well, maybe, first of all, that we are addressed here as a reader. And if we do accept these pseudo legitimations, we, if we take them as explanations, if we accept this, well, then we are maybe already part of the group. But the sixth who is being pushed away back, he comes. Well, I would suggest that with this sixth, we are also reminded, terrible as it seems, that there is such an attraction to belonging that the sixth will not be just turning around and leaving and going elsewhere. Now, a uh, footnote, I was always wondering why five and six. I thought at first that these were contingent numbers. They are not like three and seven. They're not magical numbers and they're not, you know, a triad. Why five and six? And I thought that this was arbitrary. And when I wrote about this, I also wrote that, that they're arbitrary until one day in class, I found the source, maybe the source. I think it is. You can judge by the evidence I will bring you. I was teaching Nietzsche's Zarathustra. And in the section called Neighbor Love, Nächstenliebe, there is the following sentence. So what, this is Nietzsche's uh, critique of Christian neighborly love, because he says that what neighborly love means is actually only caring for one's own kind, uh, and that this is at the expense of what Nietzsche calls Fernstenliebe, to love the one who is furthest. But the following sentence in the middle of this passage, of this section in Zarathustra. The furthest ones are they who pay for your love to the near ones. And when there are but five of you together, a sixth must always die. 
so I uh, am almost sure that this is a direct quote, but it is in any case significant that this is under the heading of the question of neighborly love. Now I come to end on the second little text. A community of scoundrels, scoundrels are Schulten of Deutsch. There was once a community of scoundrels. That is to say, they were not scoundrels, but ordinary people. They always stood by each other. If, for instance, one of them did something scoundrelly, that is to say, again, nothing scoundrelly, but just what is usual, just the normal sort of thing. And he confessed to the whole community. They investigated the case, judged it, imposed penances, pardoned, and the like. It was not badly meant. The interests of the individual members and of the community as a whole were strictly safeguarded. And he who confessed was supplied with the complementary color to the color he had shown. And in German, this play on Farbe, man sagt Farbe bekennen, when you are, you know, showing your position or point of view or ideology, Farbe bekennen. So they always stood by each other. So they always stood by each other. And even after death, they did not desert the community, but rose to heaven dancing in a ring. Ein Reigen in German. It's actually a round dance. A kind of horror. All in all, it was a vision of the purest childlike innocence to see them fly. But since everything, when confronted with heaven, is broken up into its elements, they crashed through slabs of rock. So like in the other story, there is something at the end that doesn't quite promise the success uh, and is maybe a relief in that sense. But let us look how this text works and what it does. Unlike the previous text that is about, I called it, you know, the Office of Foreign Affairs, here we are in, in a ministerium, in the office of, in the Misrada Pnim of this community. It begins very differently than the other text because the other text starts with a we and we have a speaker. Here it starts like a fairy tale. There was once a community, but maybe we should not be misled. It is a question whether somebody is speaking here or not. Maybe somebody is speaking here who is telling us a fairy tale. Now, there is something that is striking and we will look at it at first, leave it aside, then go to the center of the text and come back to this striking, strange thing. What does it mean? And so, a community of scoundrels, that is to say they were not. And then again, something scoundrelly, that is to say, just usual, normal, not. Now, what does this mean? Is it, are there a community of scoundrels or not? Why does it repeat this twice? And in German, the whole, that is to say, is only two letters, D point, H point, das heißt. So, we have to bracket this and we will come back to it. The main, the center of the text shows us what happens when one does something, anything. We will see what it is, but it is not told to us. When one does one, so let's say uh, an individual, one member of this community, and he does something that somehow manifests him as, an, as a singular instance. Now, what happens? He confessed, they investigated, judge, imposed penances, pardoned. So by confessing, he reintegrates, that's from his side and from the others, 
They are what I would call processing what he did. They are processing it to turn it into, they are neutralizing it. And it's interesting that the little word, so we have investigate, judge, pen, impose, pen, punish, pardon. So it's punish and pardon. It almost doesn't matter which one it is, as long as it's being processed uh, in that way. We have here uh, the language, the legal language, but there is also the religious language with confession. And it is suggested that many kinds of communities function in this way. And the key of the dynamic of processing and neutralizing this comes in the, okay, then we are being told that this is all fine, don't worry. You know, everybody's, everybody's um, interests are safeguarded. Now, should we really trust the one who tells us such fairy tales? Well, maybe from his perspective, the disappearance of the single voice is fine. This is precisely what keeps his, in, this is in his interests. Isn't this what members of a close community are being told? And then, and he who confessed was supplied with the complementary color to the color he had shown. Now, what are complementary colors and what do they do when you bring them together? He shows green and he's being shown red. Uh, he, when you bring, Complementary colors or complement what the, when you bring complementary colors together, what they create is gray. When you bring complementary lights together, what they create is white. In both cases, the idea is that what the single one has done is being neutralized. So, so, and in, it is in this way that they stood together and of course also in a in a parodistic way it is not bis das der tod euch scheide until death uh, will separate you but it is beyond death that they are rising to heaven and it is in the face of the truth up there that they are being smashed into pieces now we have to go back to the this das heist are they scoundrels or are they not and how does that relate us to literature? If you do this in a theoretical or philosophical text, you have a problem because you have to say if they are the one or the other. What literature does here in a performative way is that it takes us readers, we have to imagine this community as, in a, as drawing a circle and we are outside and we see this critically as a community of scoundrels. Das heist, they were ordinary people. And the text brings us inside. And from the inside, it all seems normal. It all seems perfectly, you know, fine every day. This is how things work. And then the text does this again. That doing something scandalously, oh no, no. Just the normal sort of thing. And it is in bringing us and in letting, making us cross this border and even make it cross each other, cross, make, make this border cross twice. There is something in our awareness that puts these closed borders of the community into a perspective that henceforth, or at least this is the hope of literature, one does not hear such sentences as, it is not badly meant. It is in the individual interest of all of us, single, individual, and the community. So, to end, I don't know if literature has the power to actually give solutions and create alternatives, but it certainly makes it possible for us to see together with Kafka, how 
complex our and often contradictory our human needs and impulses are and in this case the impulse toward and away from communities thank you now i heard that uh questions uh, uh comments are possible i was told that uh you can Yes, I see that there are some. Uh, Doron? Hi. Um, I have any questions, I'm sorry. I haven't received any questions. I apologize. Uh, maybe I could just then make a critical comment on my, on my talk. Um, I have given literature here a power that uh, I am not sure it has on its own. The truth is that I still am not completely sure whether Kafka feels ashamed that he cannot be part of, or on the contrary, that he's uh, proud of being out there. That maybe it requires readers, listeners, thinkers about this, who confront the texts carefully in, mm, detail and microscopic possibilities in order to make it possible and probably admit that they're projecting their own wishful thinking on the texts they read. Uh, maybe as an afterthought uh, of and a disclaimer that uh, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily the intention of Kafka, but I think that this is how literature can become uh, not so much a document as, a, as an experience. And I want to thank you all for having made it possible for me to share this experience with you. So thank you.